Hello and welcome to this overview of how to complete the Northumbria University COSH Risk Assessment Form. Hopefully by now you know that COSH stands for Control of Substances Hazardous to Health and that you're legally required to complete this form before you start work in any of the laboratories. The form needs to be completed electronically using Microsoft Word and although it states here that you need to forward the completed form to your faculty safety advisor, this needs to be done by your supervisor. This form is designed to be completed quickly and easily, and it should only take you about five or 10 minutes once you get the hang of it. First thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this box in the top right hand corner. You'll make entries in here once you've completed most of the rest of the document, but it's here as a quick reference for the technicians in the labs to be able to have a look at your COSH form and know the level of risk involved in the substances that you're handling. There are hints embedded in the document through tooltips, and wherever you see blue underlined text, things that look like web links, there's help available for you. If you hover your cursor over a link, you'll get a pop-up box and the tip is displayed. The information is presented like this because the tips give you help in completing the document, but they're not needed to be printed on the final copy. So let's start filling in the document. Section 1 contains an overview of the work that you're intending to do. What we have here are boxes and when you hover a cursor over them they'll show up in a shaded grey colour and these are the parts of the document that you can edit. Before you click on a box to enter some information you'll have some guidance text on what you're expected to type into that particular box. For this first box that's the name of the chemical to be used and the guidance text states enter the name and cast number if known of each of the hazardous chemicals to be used. I'm going to start filling in this form as if I were going to be performing a melting point analysis on benzoic acid. I'll only have one chemical to look up the information on, but it'll be a good example of how to complete the form. You need to enter the name of all of the compounds that you intend on using in your experiment, and that includes any solvents. You may not have come across cast numbers before, but these are unique identifiers that are assigned to compounds published in the literature. Unlike some names, which can be confusing at times when you've got chemicals like ethanoic acid and acetic acid, which are the same thing, the number won't change. It's unique to that compound. To find this, you need to visit the website of the manufacturer of the chemical that you intend to use. I'm using some benzoic acid from Sigma Aldrich, so I'll go to their site. Once you've found the chemical that you're looking for, you'll find a range of different purities and preparations that the manufacturer sells, but you should also be able to find the important information such as the formula, the molecular weight and the cast number. You can see we've also got a structure here so that we can be sure that we're looking at the right compound. For benzoic acid we can see that the cast number is 65-85-0. We can then enter the name benzoic acid and the cast number 65-85-0 into the first box to identify the name of the chemical used. As I mentioned before, this form is to assess the hazards involved in performing a melting point analysis on benzoic acid, so I'll fill that in as the title. The next box is a brief description of the activity, up to a maximum of 50 words. Now this is a fairly simple activity, so the description is very similar to the title, but you should use your own judgement on what to put here. And yes, I should have put melting point here. The next box is where you put the name of the person responsible for you, which will be your project supervisor. The next box is a drop-down list where you can select the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences from the list. And you also need to select the date on which this assessment was carried out. The date of reassessment has an asterisk next to it to signify there's some more information below. And for your work, that's just to specify a reassessment date of one year from today, so select that. location of the work is the lab you'll be working in. So for us that's Ellison Laboratories. In section 2 you need to fill in details of your emergency contacts. As a minimum this is going to be your project supervisor and you need their name, position and a contact telephone number that they can be reached on while you're working in the lab. The second entry could be the details of the technician responsible for the lab you're working in but it's not essential that you fill that in. Section 3 is a slightly different format. Here we've got some radio buttons. 
This section is for hazard identification and we've got a tip available if we hover over. Here you can see we're being told to refer to section 2.2 of the SDS for guidance and we'll get onto that in just a moment. Any hazardous chemicals you use should come in manufacturer's bottles which display one or more of these pictograms on them, depending on the hazard which they present. Again, you can see there's some guidance here, so hover over toxic and you can see that the pictogram corresponds to H phrases 300, 301, 310, 311, 330 and 331. If your chemical has any of these hazard phrases in its list, it will be accompanied by a toxic pictogram on the bottle. For all new chemicals that you're working with, you'll need to find out what the hazard phrases are. And to do that, you'll need the safety data sheet, which is sometimes called the SDS or the MSDS, and it's available from the manufacturer's website. If I switch back to the Sigma Aldrich page, you can see here that we have a link for the SDS. If I click on that, it will take me to a page with an embedded PDF containing the SDS for benzoic acid. These data sheets are standardized and data is arranged into sections which you can navigate easily. Here you can see the name of the compound, benzoic acid, and the CAS number, and we've also got the name and address of the manufacturer. If you scroll down to section 2, you can see the pictograms that we need. These correspond to severe health hazard and corrosive. Go back to the form and select the two pictograms by clicking on the boxes. The next section contains a range of drop-down boxes for you to select the hazard phrases appropriate for the chemicals that you're using. Click on a list and you can see the whole range of hazard phrases that you can use to populate the box. If you refer back to the SDS, the H phrases are in section 2.2 and for benzoic acid we have H315, 318 and 372. If you're performing a chemical reaction, you'd need to select the H phrases for each chemical that you use until you fill the section. If some of the hazard phrases on the SDS for two different chemicals are the same, then you only need it in this list once. There's a note underneath which states that if you intend to use CMRs, which are carcinogens, mutagens and reproductive toxins, in category 1A or 1B, you must notify the faculty safety advisor. If you want to know what chemicals fall into those categories, you can hover over the blue link to see the hazard phrases. And in this case, we do have a hazard on this list, H372, therefore special attention must be paid. If you're using one of these, you need to highlight it to your supervisor. Continue on yourself working through this document. You should be able to understand what needs to go into each section of the form now, especially if you're going to use the guidance. Where you have radio boxes, you can click them to activate them and mark them with an X, and you can also click to deactivate them. Where you have drop-down boxes, you can click on those two and select from the list. You shouldn't be able to edit any of the text beyond these boxes because the form needs to stay at the same layout. Section 5.2 is important. This is where you need to assess the risk to human health before control measures are put into place. So what would happen if you were to use the chemical without any gloves, any safety glasses or any ventilation? The outcome of this assessment is to give you a risk rating. This can be found in the appendix by clicking on the link. Risk rating is a numerical representation of how likely it is that someone would come to harm using any of the chemicals you describe and how serious that harm might be. Likelihood is assigned a number from 1 to 6, based on increasing likelihood, and severity is also assigned 1 to 6, again based on the expected outcome of the harm. The risk rating is the product of those two numbers, and it will fall along the range 1 to 36. In this table, you can see the outcome of this equation colour-coded into the range 1 to 10, which is green, 12 to 18, which is yellow, and above 20, which is red. Those activities that are considered green need you to use good lab practice to avoid harm coming to anyone. Those in yellow need you to identify specific control measures in order to reduce the likelihood of harm, and those in red require you to be specifically trained in the handling and use of a particular chemical. Here you need to decide how likely you think it would be that someone would come to harm, and that's any harm at all, without control measures in place. If we were going to use sodium chloride crystals, which are coarse solids and not very dusty, it would be unlikely or remote that harm would come to anyone nearby. If you were to accidentally ingest some sodium chloride in the course of your work, 
It's not likely to cause you harm, it's only likely to delay your work. If you were to use butyl lithium, which is pyrophoric and would ignite in contact with the moisture in the air, it's very likely that in the absence of any control measures you would come to harm. That harm would also likely be extreme, resulting in major injury or fatalities. So the risk rating for that activity would be in the red region, meaning we'd need to implement substantial control measures to reduce the risk. Returning to section 5.2, the likelihood that lab users would come into harm if they came into contact with benzoic acid. I think that harm may occur. It's not a volatile substance, although it can be a little dusty, and an inhalation risk exists. It's also possible to get some on bare skin and cause irritation. This compound presents a greater risk for long-term handling, but I know that I won't be using this very often, and so the likelihood of long-term effect is low. The severity of harm that benzoic acid could cause, I would say, would be a lost time injury. That is, they would not be able to work or attend university while recovering from that injury. Multiplying these two numbers together will give us our risk rating, which is 9. The outcome is displayed alongside the number, which indicates that we need good lab practice to handle benzoic acid in this experiment. In the event that the risk rating was higher, we would need to identify additional control measures in order to reduce that likelihood. Section 6 contains all of the control measures we can use. 6.1 is for physical and engineering controls, means of keeping us physically away from the harmful substance. Hover over the guidance tooltip and you can see that we need to refer to section 8.2 of the SDS. If we switch to the SDS and scroll to section 8.2, it's recommended that you should use a face shield and safety glasses and to handle the compound with gloves, specifically nitrile rubber gloves made to a standard outlined in regulation EN374. Go back to the COSH form and select the appropriate controls. We'll be working in a laboratory. We don't need a controlled area to work in or total containment. Bear in mind this form is for all users of the university and some may be handling substances significantly more harmful than the ones you are. Glove boxes are for working with compounds that are sensitive to air, which benzoic acid isn't. Fume cupboards would be for working with substances that are particularly dusty or volatile. Microbial safety cabinets are for handling certain microorganisms. Local exhaust ventilation is provided in some of the instrument labs to take care of exhaust gases. An access control would be used to prevent unauthorised users entering an area where particularly hazardous activities are being carried out. Here you need to specify where in the work activity the control measures need to be used. As an example, if we were preparing a dilute solution of a hazardous substance in water, it may be best practice to handle the pure solid in a fume hood, but once it's in a solution, it could be handled on the bench. You don't necessarily need all of the control measures all of the time. Use your best judgement. And if you're in doubt, ask. In this case, we're using a laboratory as our control measure, so we will state for all work involving benzoic acid. Administrative controls, as the tooltip tells us, is where we should specify training, access control or signage needed to reduce the likelihood of harm. An example in this case could be that if you're about to light a Bunsen burner on a bench. You'd need to inform other lab users of your intentions before lighting it to make sure that no one had any flammable chemicals nearby. Section 6.3 is where you would select items of PPE, which is personal protective equipment, that you would need to reduce the likelihood of harm. Here we can see we need to refer to section 8.2 of the SDS. You must always use eye protection of a minimum standard EN166, so check the label on your safety glasses. You won't be using a disposable lab coat, as you should have a proper one, and chemical suits, specialised footwear and hearing protection shouldn't be needed for your work. Again, remember this COSH form is for the whole university to use. We did see that we should use gloves and that they're of the standard EN374. Under the type used, we'll also specify nitrile rubber. We aren't using a respirator for benzoic acid and although the SDS specified use of a full face visor, as I'll just be using a small bottle of the substance, it's my judgement that that isn't necessary. It's perfectly reasonable to adapt the control measures to each use, just make sure you have the agreement of your supervisor. 
Continue on completing the form with the help of the tooltips. You need to consult the SDS for emergency procedures, for the type of firefighting equipment needed, and actions to take in the event of an accident. Section 6.8 is similar to 5.2 in that you need to calculate a risk rating. However, this section is for the risk once you've implemented control measures. The control measures are unlikely to affect the severity of the harm that a chemical can cause, but should reduce the likelihood that harm may occur. Before, I stated that harm may occur in contact with benzoic acid. I think now that we're going to use a well-ventilated laboratory, we're going to use gloves and safety glasses and a lab coat, that that's now unlikely. I think severity will stay the same should those control measures fail, but that brings the risk rating down from a 9 to a 6. Good lab practice is still required. At this point, we've calculated 6 as the risk rating once control measures are in place, and in section 5, calculated 9 as the risk rating before control measures are in place. At this point, we need to go back to the top of the page and select the appropriate risk ratings for quick reference. Scroll back down to section 6.9, and here you need to specify what supervision is required for your work. You should complete this section in discussion with your project supervisor. Finally, section 7 is where approval must be sought. After you complete this form, and you have it checked with your supervisor, you need to print it and sign it in ink. It's a requirement that we have a signature on the form to prove who did the assessment, and who approved that it was suitable for use. You need to write your name, sign here, and write in the date. Your supervisor then needs to do the same before you can get started. Don't forget, at any point you see a blue underlined link, you can hover over it and get some guidance. Know that if you do enter some data into a box and then try and hover over a link, it won't show up because your cursor is still flashing. Click out of the box and then hover over the link for the tooltip guidance. Have a go at completing your first form now, and don't forget, if in doubt, ask.